Hello. Hi. So, yeah, I'm Steve Baines. Um, a quick talk on the Apollo guidance computer. Uh, it is going to be a quick overview because it turns out that actually in 30 minutes you really can't get that much into that far into the details. So I'm just going to cover some of the um, interesting areas and particular things that by modern standards are somewhat strange. So uh, Apollo was a while ago now, um, so some people here might really not know anything much about it. So a quick summary. Uh, there were basically two spacecraft to get to the moon. Uh, the command service module or, um, on the left, the, command, the, the bit at the top, the triangular bit, is basically the command module. That's where the crew lived. Uh, everything behind that is basically fuel tanks and engine. So that's the command and service module. On the right, you have um, the LEM, the lunar lander, which was what was used to actually um, land on the moon. Um, both of those had one Apollo guidance computer in them, um, identical hardware, but slightly different software. Oops, too many slides. OK, so, um, so first thing, why, why even was there um, an Apollo guidance computer? Um, well, it basically was very much at the core of the spacecraft. So um, from this diagram, you can see you've basically got, um, at the top, you've got the disky, which I'll talk about more, which was um, crew input-output talking to the computer. You've got various uh, radio communication links, uh, uplink and downlink telemetry. Over on the left-hand side uh, is the inertial measurement unit and optics. So the inertial measurement unit was um, electronics that basically, it's, it's a gyroscope um, stabilized system, essentially, and that's used to um, Tell the, uh, allow the spacecraft to know which way it's um, orientated and what um, velocity it's doing. Um, you also have zillions of switches and so on, all uh, running through the machine. And most important of all, the engines and reaction control jets are connected through the computer. So essentially, the computer is at the core of everything. Um, and a, a big reason for this is when it comes down to it, despite what Hollywood may say, if you're flying spacecraft, you can't eyeball it. It has to be very precise uh, maneuvers at just the right time, you know, exactly the right orientation, engine on and off at exactly the right time. You can't eyeball it. So essentially, it's all run through a computer. OK, uh, so this is the, the one slide quick summary of the, the key characteristics, which on my screen is really tiny. Um, so it's a 15-bit word length, which is kind of odd. Um, a signed bit plus 14-bit uh, uh, data, if you're interpreting it as a value. Um, or uh, when it's an instruction word, it's a 3-bit opcode and a 12-bit address. And it would help if I could read that with these glasses. Um, it's an accumulator machine, a von Neumann architecture, so instructions and data are the same thing. Um, there's no stack, which is a curious thing. Uh, it did have interrupts, though. And again, if I could read this. Um, to, so the memory, it was 2K words of erasable uh, memory, 36K words of, um, of uh, fixed storage. And, and I've shown at the bottom of the slide, yeah, the kind of breakdown between opcode and, um, uh, and data. Uh, it used one's complement, which uh, just doesn't get used anymore. Um, in one's complement uh, representation, basically, to uh, negate a number, you just flip all the bits. Um, unfortunately, a side effect of that is you have two zeros, because if you have zero, you flip all the bits, you've now got all ones. That's also zero. So in this system, they had plus zero and minus zero as distinct things, which brings its own complications. I pressed the wrong button again. OK, so this is what it looked like. Uh, the box on the left, uh, the goldish colored thing, um, is the computer. The thing on the right is the disky, which uh, is the main um, interface for the, the ast astronauts used to talk to it. So it's, it was a sealed unit um, milled out of beryllium, apparently. Um, they did originally consider making it uh, user serviceable with replacement um, uh, so replaceable modules for in-flight servicing, uh, but ultimately they decided that making the whole thing sealed was actually going to be more reliable in the long run. So totally sealed unit, no user for serviceable parts. Um, if we look inside it, if you open it up, it looks like that. Um, the right hand, it's, it's basically two trays that fit back to back, and they're the trays separated. So the right hand side there is um, all of the kind of analog circuitry, so oscillators, timers, power supply, alarm circuitry, that kind of thing. The, there's a slot at the bottom where there's a kind of like missing module. That is where the um, erasable memory or the RAM goes, um, but it's not in this diagram. And the ROM, the fixed memory, is basically, again, you can't see it, but that's in the top half on the right uh, side. So the left hand half of it is where all the computer logic is, um, and that's basically a, a set of um, uh, modules. There were 24 logic modules, um, all plotted in nice and neatly. Within theory, each one of these modules is a specific aspect of the computer, such as a register or you know, so many bits of the um, ALU. So in theory, a kind of nice, tidy design. 
Um, inside these modules, the, these modules are identical. There are 24 of them, as I say. They're, they're all identical other than the wiring. Um, and they look like that. And if you turn them up hard down, they still look like that. So you basically have two single-sided circuit boards, each containing um, 60 chips, um, uh, giving, uh, meaning the whole computer's got about 3,000 chips altogether. Um, these chips are all exactly the same. Um, they're all uh, dual three-input uh, NOR gates. Um, now, NOR gates are universal logic elements. So you can build any digital logic you want if you've got NOR gates. Um, the reason they went for a single uh, chip is because this was uh, made in the very, very early days of um, integrated circuits. It was still even considered risky to be using integrated circuits at all. So the thinking was that, well, if we only use a single type of chip, the manufacturers have got a realistic chance of getting good at making that one chip, and we should get good manufacturing yields. So. Hence, the whole thing, all of the logic is made entirely out of the one type of chip. It's only got six transistors in it. Um, and that's what it looks like inside. Um, the transistors are the small blobs right in the middle, and the most of the linear structures around it are the, are the resistors. So it was good for yield, um, good for manufacturing reliability, uh, but it doesn't actually lead for a very efficient uh, system. Although you can build anything out of NOR gates, it's not a very efficient way of doing it. Um, if you check the schematics, it turns out that about a quarter of all of the gates were just used as inverters. So having three inputs where you only need one is a, a huge waste. Um, if they made a chip as well, which um, was just inverters, then with the same kind of level of integration, they could have fit four per chip instead of two, um, and they could have basically got away with 21 um, logic modules instead of 24, which would have been a you know, significant saving, especially when getting the weight down was really important. But you know, these are the trade-offs, and they went for, we'll go for one thing to make it reliable. Um, so the, I think I skipped, uh, no, oh no, that's okay. Um, so the, this is the disky. Um, as I say, this is the main way the, uh, the um, astronauts operated the computer. Essentially, um, it's kind of a glorified numeric keypad um, in the bottom half. Top left is a bunch of various alarms that the computer would trigger for various things you need to worry about. And the right-hand side, the main piece of information is there are basically three five-digit numbers. That's essentially your monitor. That's the information that the computer could give you, just three five-digit numbers. Um, uh, so a, a few curious things about this. Well, first of all, as I say, it's, it's essentially a glorified numeric keypad, but on the left-hand side, I'm not sure how visible it is, the two keys on the left are curiously named verb and noun, which is kind of more, more in place for a text adventure game. Um, but the, the, but it's, a, it's a very clever idea. Um, this was, again, this was developed when people were still really figuring out how, how, how should people operate a computer. And in this particular case, they needed something astronauts wearing uh, spacesuits and gloves with very, you know, had to be able to operate. So big, chunky buttons and a simple interface. So the idea was that uh, the verb-noun interface is that the general way the astronauts would instruct the computer what they wanted it to do is they would press verb, type in a number that represented what they wanted to do, and then noun and another number representing what they wanted it to do it to. So for example, verb six means display in decimal, and noun 43 is latitude, longitude, altitude. So you type verb 6, noun 43, enter, and on the three displays you get your latitude, longitude, and altitude in decimal. And they had cheat sheets. You can see one below on the right, um, a cheat sheet, so that you don't have to remember what all these numbers are. Um, another curious thing is the, um, the display, it doesn't have decimal points on it. You kind of assume there probably are, but there aren't. The decimal points are implied. And again, this is on the cheat sheet. If you're um, looking at, um, uh, if you, usually if you're looking at something that's in degrees, then it's in hundreds of a degree. Uh, if it's a distance, it's in a tenth of a mile. And you either remember this or look in the cheat sheet. Um, this, this whole idea of the disk incidentally, was not something that was kind of carefully planned. It originated from a lab demo. People working on the computer needed something to show visitors. Um, so they came up with this idea. Well, OK, we'll use this verb noun thing we've just dreamt of. And apparently, there was quite a lot of opposition to it. Um, it got described as not scientific, not military, not serious, not dignified. And my favorite one, um, astronauts won't be able to understand it, which <laughs> I think is, really? Um, so, but yeah, they did. Um, and a final thing, it's also, they're not LEDs. Um, it's an electroluminescent panel, um, a high voltage um, electroluminescent with a ton of LED, uh, sorry, a ton of um, relays. I think it's 130 relays behind them. And it had a relatively low, low update rate because the computer could only communicate, essentially change one set of relays at a time. So it would be, an, I, would, I don't have a video unfortunately, but it would take, you know, it, if it was redrawing the whole display, even though there's not much in it, it would, you, know, you could see it very clearly refreshing. 
Okay, um, very quickly about memory. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so erasable used magnetic core memory, which was fairly standard technology for the time. Uh, a grid of ferrite, uh, which got magnetized one way or the other to represent a one or a zero. Um, this isn't actually out of the Saturn, sorry, out of the um, AGC because I couldn't find any good AGC pictures um, for the um, for the erasable memory. Uh, as I said, the slot that it fits in, you notice it was a kind of long rectangle, so the real thing was kind of all folded up rather than sort of flat like that, and and then potted. And there just don't seem to be many good pictures. But that's out of the Saturn V for yeah for good measure. Um, so that was erasable, um, as I say, standard technology for the time. A curious thing about erasable, sorry, magnetic core memory is it's, um, it's non-volatile, which is nice. You can turn it off and on, and it still remembers the same things. Um, but reading it is destructive. So if you read it, you've just set that location to zero. So if you don't want it to be zero, you need to write it back again. Um, it's just a, a quirk of the way the, the technology worked. So for the, the fixed memory, uh, they use something different. It looks superficially similar, and this is actually from the AGC. This is a, a core rope module. Um, it's, um, it looks superficially similar, but it's not actually arranged in a grid. It kind of looks like it there. Um, if I skip to the next slide, it's a close-up of it. What, the way core rope worked is essentially um, the, the data isn't stored in the, the, in the ferrite rings. The ferrite rings are used as switching cores, essentially transformers. Um, and the data is stored in the wiring, because the whole point is this is supposed to be um, fixed memory. So the, the wires would be woven through these cores, and for each bit position, each addressable bit, it would go through one core if it was a one, or through a different core if it was a zero. And you can kind of see, going from left to right, it kind of snakes around left to right at the top and then around and back across to the left. You see the two core rows in the middle don't actually have any wires between them. So this conceptually is just a long string. It just got folded up to kind of fit inside uh, the, inside the, uh, the package. Um, and these were hand woven. Um, this is um, some lady at uh, Raytheon who, um, who manufactured these, um, sent wiring by hand, um, the, the, the core memory. So the idea was this machine would, there was a little kind of guide, a little pointer. Um, the, and the machine would kind of, she would thread the wire through, and then the machine would kind of move on to the next location. So she, she's got a pointer saying, thread it here, now thread it here, now thread it here. Because, of course, you can't really afford any mistakes. And however careful you are, you're going to, if you're doing it entirely manually, you're going to yeah, make mistakes. OK. Um, so unfortunately, that's it for the nice pictures, because I now get into the, the computer itself, and it's kind of hard to find photos of how a computer works. Um, so the memory, um, as I say, it was 12-bit um, tw addressing, um, but they had 38K um, of memory. Um, so that doesn't fit. So there was a banking system. And essentially, the first 1K of addressable memory was all erasable. Uh, the remaining 3K was fixed. But the top of erasable and the bottom of um, fixed uh, used a banking system. And there were banking registers, um, which is on the next slide, which basically show where in the memory map um, the, the how, how the, um, the different banks of erasable or uh, fixed memory are slotted in. So essentially, most of it is, um, is always in the same place, but then there's a whole load of um, banks that can um, be selected in. Uh, in particular, there's a lot for the fixed. Um, but remember, th this couldn't load any software. All of the software for the entire mission um, had to be uh, built into the machine. So essentially, you know, loading new software was, to a certain extent, switching banks. Uh, OK. So uh, at the bottom memory of the registers, it's all um, memory mapped. So A, the accumulator, all, any mathematics goes through the accumulator, like with most very early machines. Uh, there's then L, which is a lower accumulator, which is essentially an extension to the accumulator for um, uh, longer operations. Uh, you then have Q, return address register. Um, there was no stack. So um, if you branched somewhere, then the return address would go into Q. If you wanted to, so if you jump to a subroutine, return address would go in queue. If that subroutine wanted to go to another subroutine, OK, you now have the responsibility as a programmer to store the current value of queue somewhere so that when you jump to the subroutine and it returns to you, you can, you can get back. So there's no stack. You have to, as a programmer, you'd have to manage all of that manually. And similarly, parameters, they can't get pushed onto a stack. They have to be in you know, well-known locations. Um, so. Yeah, so, so most of the uh, locations in erasable memory were kind of pre-allocated. Uh, so essentially, everything was global. Um, there was no memory protection or anything. Um, and memory locations would be reused, uh, but they'd be reused between programs that wouldn't run at the same time. So for example, code that's running during re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere has got nothing to do with orbiting the moon. So programs for those different phases can reuse the same memory locations. Um, 
So uh, I'll skip the next few. Um, the bottom of the slide, uh, there's four uh, things called the edit registers. These are interesting. Again, these are just memory locations, really. Um, the, the instruction set doesn't have um, any bit shift um, operators, uh, but it does have these edit operation locations. Um, if you write a value to one of those locations and then read it back again, it's been bit shifted or cyclic shifted. So there you have, although you don't have an opcode um, for uh, bit shifts, you, you can achieve them does have the curious side effect that you can't use them if you're in an interrupt, because interrupts need to restore the state, and you can't restore the state of those registers, because if you read it and write it back, you've changed it. Uh, next in memory is uh, times and counters. These kind of store the critical state of the system. So first up, uh, timers. Um, the, the first one, timer one and two, is essentially just literally a mission timer. Um, I think it would run for about a month before it overran, so a two-week mission to the moon was fine. Um, timer three was for things called uh, waitlist tasks, which were very short but time-critical tasks, which would be scheduled to happen at a specific time, interrupt-driven. Um, timer four was a general um, kind of um, interrupt-driven household, um, household, uh, sorry, housekeeping, um, um, type code, and five and six were the digital autopilot. It was a fly-by-wire system, um, and um, an interrupt kind of made sure that this kind of was running smoothly. So essentially, timer five was used to make sure that the digital autopilot code got run every 100 milliseconds, so 10 hertz some update rate. And timer six had the rather important um, task of timing when to turn off reaction control jets. So every time the autopilot did a pass, it would decide which jets, if any, it needed to turn on to adjust orientation. Um, and it would then set timed interrupts based on counter six as to when these jets should be turned off. So every time timer six expired, it would then call an interrupt service routine, which would turn off that axis worth of jets and then wait for the next one. So a lot of it ran on interrupts, which is super critical. The next slide I will skip over. That's how all of those things fit together, but I just absolutely don't have time to go through them now. The slides are available, so some of this stuff is, the idea is if you're interested, you can look at it later. Um, the instruction set, uh, as I say, it's basically you only had um, three bits. Um, so um, you've only got eight instructions, which really isn't many. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I'm getting behind on time, so I'll, I'll skip through quickly. But yeah, you only had eight basic instructions. It's true and complete, but it's, you know, not much to work with. Um, so uh, one, in, one particular, uh, transfer to storage, which is save the accumulator to a memory location. Simple enough. Um, but also, if the accumulator has overflowed, skip the next instruction. Um, okay. Um, whether the, over, whether the accumulator is overflowed is kind of important because there's no way of storing the overflow state. So as with the edit uh, registers, uh, if you've got an overflow in A, you can't have an interrupt. So if there's an overflow in A, interrupts are disabled. Um, given how much runs on interrupts, that's not including turning off reaction control jets, that's not good. So you, so the program of being uh, responsible for and carefully handling um, overflows was super important. It's very unusual that say that an overflow causes the interrupts to be disabled, but that's how it worked. So this was one of the main ways of handling it, is this instruction. It clears the overflow, and it, you've got a branch, depending on, you couldn't directly test for an overflow. This instruction was essentially the simplest way of, of doing it, because you, you've got a conditional branch, essentially. Um, the next interesting one, this is your kind of comparison instruction, uh, which is actually a four-way comparison. Um, it'll jump, it'll, well, it skips one, zero, one, two, or three instructions, depending on the, whether the accumulator, um, sorry, whether the value at a particular memory location is uh, greater than uh, zero, uh, less than zero, or equal to plus zero, or equal to minus zero. So again, you have the, the two distinct zeros in there. Um, now, as I say, uh, eight instructions, it's true and complete, but it's, it's not very easy to work with. It's quite clunky. So they, they squeezed a lot more um, instructions in there. Um, so the first thing they noticed is, oh, okay, well, if you've got, for example, increment um, value at a memory location, that only makes sense to do that on RAM, erasable storage. Erasable storage is always 10-bit, so the upper two bits of the address, you don't need those for that, those instructions. So you can re reuse those opcodes, essentially, for new instructions. So they introduced um, a bunch of new instructions. Um, the, the most important one there is um, index, which, um, it, so index k, it takes the value at memory location k, and then it adds that value to the opcode sorry, adds that value to the next instruction word, um, which has the effect that it's provided you a way of um, doing in indexed addressing. Which, so again, there isn't an indexed addressing mode as such, but there is this kind of slightly hacky workaround which achieves that. 
Um, and then also, it doesn't make sense to do a branch to the banking registers, um, which I, I skipped over those. The, the bank control registers were also in the initial, uh, the very low memory address. So it makes no sense to branch to the uh, memory uh, banking registers. So again, those bit patterns got interpreted as, as new um, opcodes. Uh, so the, the main ones on there are basically enabling and disabling interrupts and returning from interrupts. But there's also extend, extra code. Uh, okay, what's extra code? Well, that says interpret the next instruction word according to a completely different set of decoding rules. So you've just doubled the size of your instruction set. Um, and they did similar tricks with that to, again, rather than just get an extra eight, they got a whole bunch more. So in the end, they packed basically 40 instructions into three bits, kind of. Um, so yeah. Um, but it was still kind of... Um, Still quite primitive. Um, the, with the new instructions, still the, the most advanced mathematical operation you had was single precision multiply and divide. And it's all integer, by the way. I forgot to mention. There's no, none of that floating point stuff. Everything's integer, and, um, and it's up to the programmer to scale things and handle overflows. So th even with this uh, kind of extended instruction set, the most, um, the, strongest, the most powerful mathematics you can do is multiplying integer divide, multiple integer multiply into, uh, integer divide. So what they then did, and this is, um, I think, the real nice thing, um, is, hang on, have I got these in the wrong order? Uh, ah, right, sorry, yeah, slight digression. Um, yes. The, what they then did is later. Um, so having talked about the interrupt-driven stuff, not everything was interrupt-driven. You've got um, a whole bunch of um, things um, where you've got longer running jobs, so essentially like navigation software. You're trying to do a navigation solution. Um, it's not interrupt-driven. doesn't need to be super um, uh, responsive. Um, so you, essentially, you need a way of running, running jobs that are long-running, um, and they just you know, with different priorities, and they just kind of complete whenever they complete. So they did implement um, a, um, a multitasking system, but it was a cooperative multitasking system. Every job had to cooperate with every other job. It only works if you can totally trust all of the software. Um, so rather than there being an operating system that would basically forcibly switch contexts, um, instead what happened at each job, every 20 milliseconds was supposed to check if there is a higher priority job waiting, and if there is, voluntarily hand over control. Um, and and they and and basically, if they don't, then the system falls apart. Um, one one nice feature in there though is that um, obviously, if you, for example, due to a software bug, got stuck in an infinite loop, then you could end up with a program that's currently running stops checking for other jobs, and these other jobs will then never run. So there is a hardware hardware watchdog that is monitoring the location that you check to see if there's a higher priority job waiting. And if half a second goes by, I think 640 milliseconds goes by without that being checked, then the computer does a restart. So that gets a chance to break out of out of that. Um, okay, time's getting a bit low, so I'll quickly skip over this. Um, yeah, so again, if you want to look at the slides, there's more detail here, including my own notes on this. Um, essentially, the message here is that um, they, it could support these multiple jobs, but each one had a kind of, um, the kind of context for that was very small. You had basically, I think, 12 memory words, which were basically the, uh, the scratch pad space that that task could use, um, and then a couple of extra words just to kind of manage the system. Um, the wait lists um, I will also skip over, but they, they were just the um, triggering tasks at very specific times. So the thing that I thought we'd got to earlier, but I was uh, getting ahead of myself, the really nice thing, um, is the interpreter. So as I say, we're, uh, the, the most powerful instructions uh, you've got is a hardware, sorry, is a multiply or divide. Um, and, um, and, um, and you, but but you know, but the kind of tasks that you're potentially uh, solving uh, tend to involve an awful lot of um, matrix and uh, vector algebra. You know, you're dealing with orientations and accelerations and velocities and trying to sort, you know, solve trajectories. So that's kind of hard to do if you're working at kind of you know the level of just scalars. Um, so they introduced um, an interpreter system, which was essentially a virtual machine. Um, they simulated an entirely different architecture. Um, which had a much richer instruction set and was much simpler to work with. So it was, um, it had seven bit opcodes instead of 14, so you've got, sorry, instead of three, so you've immediately got lots of space for, um, for different um, operations. They used a flat memory space, so you didn't have to worry about banking. Um, and um, it, 
But, but in particular, the, the key thing about it is it, it had this idea that rather than the accumulator now just being a single scalar value, um, it had a thing called a, the multi-purpose accumulator, which could represent a single, double, or triple precision scalar value, or a double precision vector. So you've now got an accumulator that's a vector. That's pretty impressive for a, a, an early computer. Um, and the, the, the virtual instructions that they implemented on this, as I say, a very rich instruction set, 127 instructions, included things like matrix multiply and vector normalization and projection, um, trigne trigne uh, trigonometric functions, um, all kinds of things that basically would be you know, a nightmare to do with the, or you know, cumbersome and error prone to do using the low level, um, you know, the raw um, instructions. Um, so I'm struggling slightly because on my preview, I can't actually read that text. Uh, if I close that, that's better, yeah, okay. So yeah, so the interpreter used a substantial amount of the memory of the system, and the memory was very, very tight, even with all this banking going on. Um, there was a lot of software that got developed for the uh, computer, but it ultimately got scrapped simply because it would be useful but not absolutely essential. So especially for things like handling kind of non-nominal situations where we could get into this situation, and if we do, it'd be really useful to have a piece of software that can solve this kind of thing. And they ended up just scrapping most of that because space. Um, they couldn't, you know, even if you extended the banking, you'd still need to weave more and more core ropes and physically find space for them and so on. Um, but, they, but nonetheless, they decided that even though uh, memory uh, was very, very tight, uh, that it was well worth uh, devoting a substantial amount of that memory to implement this interpreter, which then allows people to write in, you know, write the, basically allow the people writing the navigation software to worry about the navigation algorithms rather than worrying about you know, working with very, very low-level um, operations. And I find it quite interesting that on such a, an early machine with very, very, that was very slow in the first place, um, again, I, I skipped it, the, the clock speed of this is basically a megahertz, but it's 12 clocks per instruction cycle, and most instructions took two cycles. So it's about 40,000 instructions a second. So it's pretty slow. Um, the interpreter is much slower still because you're running an emulated machine. Um, but it's interesting that you know, they found that it was, you know, they, they realized even then that it was well worth paying this overhead in computer time on a computer that was already very slow in order to make programmers more productive and, and you know, make it less likely that they would make mistakes because they could focus on the domain they were trying to solve, navigation, and not have to worry so much about the hardware. And this idea of abstracting away the hardware to allow you to use a kind of higher level um, language it's, it's not really a high-level language, it's, you know, but it's, a, it's a, a, an easier-to-use machine with a much richer instruction set, so you don't have to worry so much about the, the fine details. I think it's kind of very interesting that they uh, realized, even back then, that this was, you know, was well worth doing. Uh, and I think I'm almost there now. Um, again, this is... Uh, I've got... Well, I've got a, a couple of minutes. So... Um, so essentially, yeah, I, so the one thing with the interpreter is you did need to store additional states because obviously this simulated machine has context. So you could run, um, if you were running programs that ran on the, the kind of the native instruction set, then the, the task that you, uh, the, you had, yeah, the task storage gave you about 12 words that you could use for whatever you liked for general storage. The, if you were running an interpreted program, then when you launched the job, you had to specifically say, I will be using the interpreter for this. Didn't mean you had to only use the interpreter, because another of the nice things about it is you could freely switch between the interpre interpreted code and normal code very, very simply. It wasn't a kind of an all or nothing. So it's very common that you know, the code will use the interpreter for part of it and then jump into um, the kind of the low level language and perhaps jump back again. But if you are going to use the interpreter, you need a so-called VAC area, um, which essentially um, is you know, an additional chunk of memory. Um, and there were, I think, five of those allocated. Yes, five allocated, uh, which essentially store the, the state of the, the kind of that virtual machine. And the final thing I'll talk about, which sadly I don't have any. I was hoping to get some nice audio for this, but um, oh, I completely skipped something that's uh, that's required for this. I'll try and cover it very quickly. So there's this concept of um, um, unprogrammed sequences. So I mentioned about the, you have the, um, the um, inertial measurement unit, the IMU, which stores the orientation and velocity. Um, essentially, you know, these, these are values. 
which the computer needs space to access, and these were mapped into memory. But they, it was essentially a one bit up down. So what happened is every time the spacecraft rotated or accelerated by a certain amount, a pulse would get sent to the computer, which would then steal the next process, the next CPU cycle to increment or decrement the appropriate counter. So if the thing's accelerating rapidly or it's rotating quickly, you have tons of these pulses coming in, and every time a pulse arrives, the next um, CPU cycle gets stolen from normal operations and is used to just increment or decrement a specific memory location. So the 1201, 1202, the famous alarms on the Apollo 11 moon landing, they're coming into land, 1201, 1202, what does this mean? Panic, panic. The, in, a, in a nutshell, what was happening is there was an undiagnosed problem with the power supplies, which meant that if you turned on one of the power supplies for the rendezvous radar at the wrong time, you had these two power supplies slightly out of phase, which caused um, the, the radar tracking uh, system to think that the radar was constantly jittering around, sending zillions of these pulses to the computer saying increment, decrement, increment, decrement. Um, and that caused an additional 15, uh, uh, still 15% of the processor time on the computer. The computer was already loaded very heavily because it was final stages of the lunar landing. So Suddenly, 15% of its time has been taken away. Um, and that's what caused these overflows, what, uh, these alarms. But what happens when these alarms happen is the computer then does um, a bailout, which is basically a reboot, um, but it reboots in about a second. Um, and the jobs that were important, such as the landing software, leave checkpoints basically saying, if I'm restarted, this is where, you know, this is the, this is the last safe state, essentially. So the, soft, the important jobs could pick up more or less where they were, and the less important jobs just get chucked out of the system, and that freed up just enough processing power that despite the fact you had all of these, you know, spurious interrupts from this fault coming in, the computer still had just enough computer power to keep up with real time and keep the lander stable and ultimately a successful mission. And I think I'm out of time. Um, I'll hang around at the end if anybody's got any questions. Um, and um, yeah, otherwise, hope you enjoyed the talk. And thank you.